Hey there, this is Ari. Welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. I am very excited for today's guest. His name is Jean-Francois Tremblay, and he is on for the second time, at least the second time. I might have already done uh, It is the second time. Okay. My, I was thinking maybe it's the third, but we've had so many private conversations. I don't know what uh, we recorded or not. So um, Jean-Francois is one of the world's foremost experts on peptides and peptide therapy. And he runs a research lab in Canada called CanLab, where they produce peptides. And, uh, and again, just widely regarded as the creme de la creme in terms of knowledge of this topic. I also have to say, if, as soon as I got on with him, the first thing I, I said to him was, you look younger since two years ago. Uh, when I, when we did the last podcast. And so I said, you have to share your secrets of why you look younger two <laughs> years later. So we're hopefully going to talk about that as well. Uh, so peptides, this is an absolutely fascinating subject that relates to so many different health goals from uh, healing tissues, healing injuries, uh, to gut health, to immune health, to changing body composition, muscle gain, and fat loss, uh, athletic performance, anti-aging, uh, there's so many different topics we could touch on. We're going to hopefully get to a lot of those in this session. And I'm going to take as much time as Jean-Francois will let me take from him. Um, you let me know when you have a hard cut off and you have to go. <laughs> so first of all, what are peptides? Let's assume people didn't listen to the previous podcast. They need a quick refresher on what are peptides and, and how they work. Okay. Very fast. Uh, two things about that uh one they're uh molecules that we may our body make so they're natural like any other things that we make uh and other in others uh, some cases they're actually extracted from uh food from meat uh from proteins basically and that brings me to their descriptions Basically, peptides are the break, the end result almost of the breakdown of a protein. So you, you take the protein in meat. Uh, if it goes through digestion, then it's going to be broken down in a, a smaller protein and down to what we call uh, a peptide, which is basically a chain of amino acids. And if it's brought down further in its breakdown, then it breaks down in amino acids to be absorbed. But uh, many times since we produce them, they don't go through digestions. So they remain for a good while in their peptidic form. So a chain of amino acid. And it's that chain, that uh, structure that has uh, biological effects uh, within the body. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what what kind of biological effects? So, yeah, actually, let uh, me... uh, uh, it's estimated that we have about a quarter million peptides going around the body. It it basically name it. It does it that went somewhere somehow. Okay, uh, but generally they're, they're what we call um, uh, signaling molecules. So. They, they, they kind of tell a cell or a mitochondria, or even in some cases, it introduces itself in, in the nucleus of the cell to tell them what, what's next what to, or what to do now. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're signaling molecules. Got it. Okay, so you could contrast these molecules from, let's say, drugs, pharmaceuticals, in the sense that these, our body has, you know, hundreds or thousands of different peptides that it's are circulating all the time and that are signaling for certain reactions to take place. Yes is that and accurate? no. Okay, it is, but that's the whole difference between peptides and drugs. Uh, a drug will force its action. Meaning if you have high blood pressure, you take a drug for that, it's going to lower your blood pressure, right? 
But if you don't have high blood pressure and you take the drug, then it will still lower your blood pressure and could be actually life threatening. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you don't want that. So either you have or not high blood pressure, the drug will push its action. It will mm -hmm. lo lower blood pressure. A peptide, it's kind of uh, intelligent in that sense. Not in the sense that you can play chess with them, but <laughs> in the sense that it will, uh, most of the time, there, there are exceptions always, but most of the times, and uh, much so with the natural ones, not those that are analogs of, uh, they won't push their action. They, if their action is to heal by increasing uh, a tissue, uh, proliferation and all, all that, it will do so when and where it's needed. Mm -hmm. So you won't see extra proliferation of tissue where the tissue is sane. We just, just pass along. So uh, that's why it's, again, with some very specific peptides, you can take too much. But for more than 90% of them, you cannot overdose, you cannot have bad side effects. Uh, basically, in again, I, I put the emphasis because there is always that guy that, no, but I got this, you know? Right. So yeah, it does happen, very, very small percentage. And usually that's due to other conditions that bring about those reactions. Uh, they're worry free, you know, you shouldn't worry that, you know, I uh, have to go to the emergency at four in the morning because you took too much the night before. Right. So that's the huge difference. And that's what makes me love them. Basically, mm -hmm. uh, they're great. Okay. So uh, maybe let's start with some of the biggest myths around peptides. What, what are some of the, the myths that are very prevalent out there as people start to learn about this topic? Okay, one of the first thing people will encounter when they start to go on the internet is, uh, well, same place they're gonna see that podcast, by the way, but anyway, this one is good. <laughs> uh, is that peptides are fragile, which is not true in the sense that, you know, that you have to not shake the vials, you have to uh, keep them in the fridge all the time. And uh, yeah, no, no, you can break down if, if you're really, really, really not careful. But in general, and we did some testing in our lab stability test, and there are peptides that were thought to be uh, unstable, like once you reconstitute that they would last for a, a few hours. Mm. Turns out that even after a month, they were like all there. So wow. that that was a myth, I, I don't know. Well, that one in part, it's much C, it's called. That one in particular, it makes sense to think so, but once you test it, you realize, because, even biochemistry is not an exact science like medicine. You know, I, I know doctors don't like to hear that, but it's not, if it was an exact science, they could predict the outcome. And I, I think we've, we've <laughs> I, th I think we've learned that lesson pretty clearly over the last couple of years that it's definitely not go. an exact science, you know, seeing how many of the, the predictions from the medical community about you know, non both non pharmaceutical and pharmaceutical uh, measures yeah. have not panned out as predicted at all. So uh, biochemistry, it's like that. It's mainly an exact science. It's exact on for what we did, but new things like new synthesis of a new peptide that was never done before. Yeah. So on paper, because in that peptides there is a, two links of amino acids that are known to be kind of weak. So normally you could predict a fast degradation. And actually we thought so. Uh, when we synthesized it, we thought, oh, but this one won't be stable. So we have to make one dose vial because it wouldn't sustain. But once we 
synthesized it and we had it around, you know, like purification and all that and retest and say, oh, it seems to be much more stable than we would expect. And it turns out it is. So, you know, I cannot blame the people who said that because it's kind of a, a prediction mm -hmm. but at one point the, after a few months a few years maybe they should have tested it and you know and well with it and it turns out so long story short they are much more stable than what we thought mm -hmm. uh, another misconception and that can be very practical uh, good to know is that you cannot mix peptides in the same vial in the same syringe mm. yes you can uh, because people some people believe they will interact to form some hybrid molecules that would you know make you grow a turn leg or a tail i don't know uh, no you can mix them because they're molecule that ha uh, they don't have charges no, they're not the molecule plus one or plus two or minus one so they cannot inter react at room temperature they don't even inter react at 37 celsius within the body where we have thousands and we don't see those interactions mm -hmm. So there is no reason for them to interact in the fridge uh, for like 24 hours, uh, 33 hours and 50 minutes. Let's say you take it out 10 minutes. No, uh, you can mix them. We tested it with a couple of them, no interactions, except there can't, those people, if they ever saw an interaction and I doubt it because nobody actually tests those things, uh, the only times that you would see those interactions is if you get a really bad quality peptides mm. and that being not well synthesized and it would have, they would have a charge and they would interact, mm. but that's the only case. And so if those people who say that saw an interaction, it just tells me that they were working with bad quality peptides. That's all, because when they're done the right way, purify the right way and everything is done right, there are no interactions between peptides in the same uh, liquid. Got it. Um, one, one more myth that I could think of that I think is worth you commenting on is the idea that you have to inject uh, for example, BPC locally, directly into the injured tissue. If you're able to do so, yes, it okay. works. Uh, now, you know, after two years and uh, more, you know, I'm in touch with so many doctors and clinicians. Uh, actually, by the way, we're starting, uh, you know, I'm doing a bit of a bit of a placement uh we're uh, i i uh, had the idea then uh the international peptide academy uh where we'll be giving seminars and courses mainly for doctors but everybody uh will be able to attend uh, so and with dr matt cook in mm -hmm. california so that's uh, our thing now and uh too much placement. I forgot what was the question. <laughs> the the, the Sorry. BPC directly injected. Oh, yeah, directly. So, you know, I have all those doctors now that I've done local. Uh, Matt does uh, infiltrations and uh, hydro dissection uh -huh. where, you know, you do a, a, an injections, let's say between, uh, let's say there is a nerve that is compressed. Uh, so he does, that's why it's called a dissection, but you dissect with water. So you inject water, let's say between the nerve and the, the tissue that is compressing it. So releasing the pressure on the nerve. Mm. Uh, but many times that's gonna leave the nerve damage. Let's say you, you'll see it with the sciatic uh, nerve uh, thing where, you know, you twist badly your back, it pinches the, the nerve, but then everything falls back in place, but the pain uh, continue. 
And there has been case for years and years. There is that case of a woman he treated 15 years and nothing worked. Mm -hmm. So it did an hydro dissection because many times it's the fascia that, and it kind of stick there. So even if the bone structure, muscle structure comes back to the right position, that compression remains. So he injects water to release that pressure between the fascia and the nerve or whichever tissue was uh, press, uh, pressing it, which causes inflammation. And But many times there is small damages that even when the pressure is released, the pain continue. So uh, it's the first one I've known to do that with hydro dissection. It would mix BPC-157 and thymazine beta-4 mm. in the water we would use to do the hydro dissection. And you would have a very strong and immediate uh, healing of the tissue in that spot and the case of that woman that was in pain for 15 years California Norton you know crazy stuff she tried everything nothing worked uh, it did that I do next section maybe it took him five ten minutes for the procedure another five ten minutes all pain was was gone never came back wow just like that wow. so it works amazingly good when you can but you have to go in the injury, not next to it. Like people believe you have pain in, let's say, in the elbow. So you shoot near the elbow. No, because there is too many uh, capillaries and blood vessel. Even if it's a small distance in between, the peptides will be snatched by, by, those, uh, by the blood circulation before it reaches the tissue. Mm -hmm. It will come back to the tissue through the blood circulation, not through direct diffusion. Yeah. So unless you can pinpoint, and most of the time it has to be done on, under ultrasound to see exactly where you go with the needle. Even the best, they did a study, uh, people, doctors that were doing uh, infiltration like for years, and uh, but without ultrasounds and they did two groups uh, one with ultrasounds uh, ultrasound 100 percent of the time they would uh, hit the spot uh even like experts in infiltration doing it for years 25 percent of the time they, they would miss the spot without ultrasound without ultrasound and they were sure they, they were at the right place they would say yeah yeah it, it is here no 25 percent you say, okay, 75%, yes, but you know, it's not you doing it for the first time. So chances are you're going to miss the right spot. Anyway. Right. Got it. Okay. It's very interesting because two years ago, you you had said it was a myth that injecting directly into the spot. So it's it's great that you've changed. Well, your, that, your... yeah, it's at the time, uh, because it was, yeah, no, of course, you know, uh, it's kind of... Um, amplification it is a myth locally in the way that people thought you would need to do it right right so, so yeah that, that's but it's it great that you've, you've kind of evolved your thinking on that as you've gotten feedback from all these doctors who have been doing these kinds of procedures oh yeah and so and talking you know, of uh have, uh, later on there is a big one coming on that uh, yeah <laughs> Yeah. Uh, mea culpa thing. Anyway. Okay. So for, for people listening, some of the, what you just heard is kind of a high level of detail talking about specific peptides. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we didn't lose you. Um, I want to get into some of the specific peptides for specific purposes right okay. now. So um, epitalon is something that we talked about a couple of years ago. This is, I believe, a Russian uh, peptide bio they call it a bioregulator and it's it's kind of considered the longevity peptide and the last time we spoke there was some promising research where i, I believe they showed lengthening of telomeres and maybe life extension in animal studies and then you mentioned during our podcast that there was another study that was currently going on and that the results that the study wasn't finalized yet and the results weren't in has that study completed now? And if so, what are the I results haven't of it? seen anything since okay. that time Okay, where they kind of released early results. Let's say you, they, they, they were to do a six-month study. Well, actually, well, 
uh, you know, a, my, a, a mouse lives two to three years. And that was, so maybe they're, you know, they're still all alive and, you know, they wait for them to die of old age. So I didn't see anything final results yet. And that's probably the cause, you know, they wait for the last mouth to die mm -hmm. and then see if she lived longer or not. But the, uh, that, preliminary study what they looked one of the marker they looked during that study and that they released was the lengthening of the telomeres and uh, it showed that no it's actually their shortening in, in the study they did mm -hmm. it's not conclusive but it's one of those thing that makes you go ah you know <laughs> yeah sure and i think i explained it at the time i i wouldn't go crazy about that uh telomere lengthening because the the science on telomeres uh, measuring is not you know you uh, you may take a sample of a tissue in your body and measure the telomeres length in those tissue and then take another tissue and it's going to be different you know it's it seems to vary depending on the organ the tissues and all that uh, so even if they take uh, always from the same tissue is it the right tissue to measure aging in terms yeah. you know to correlate with so that's why i always been and and those studies that were done uh, on epitalon and telomeres they were done like 20 years ago yeah. about uh, the science of measuring telomeres where it was even more native. So I would, I, I don't give it much credit. And actually the whole uh, word of science isn't anymore. Now they use other markers. Uh, there is even True Age, a company that came out with uh, the test. I don't remember exactly what, but it's much more accurate actually. Yeah, I think uh, that from, from what I've read, the the best marker of biological aging is DNA methylation. The, yeah, the that's the one they, they, they measure. And it turns out it's much more precise. Right. So um, at this point, it would be interesting for somebody to do a study on the epitalon and measuring that. Then uh, it would be much more conclusive. But it doesn't mean it doesn't do the other things that it does because aging is not only telomere length it's if it was only that then it would be home free just stop that and we're safe no it's multifactorial it's like the same way the body has backup systems uh like you know you have two kidneys two lungs uh well only one heart but you know many times there is a backup system uh, even biological so let's say your, your glucose system it fails then you have the fatty acid system that jumps in and the, you know the body is well designed in that sense so but I think I explained back then to what I believe to you know the the body is programmed eventually to die and it seems that it has back backup system where if one system is not trigger hey don't worry you will die anyway because now we have this system so you know it's the other side to the coin yeah so there is not one factor and you see that it's funny and not when you look at researchers that research anti-aging and they look at one thing one drug one compound and all that and they all it's always the same thing oh we found we found it uh, and i'm sure they're taking it and then you look at those people like when they are in their 70s and they look like old residents right. it's like yeah what happened with your anti-aging product not that it's not true but that's not the only one it's 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 you know exercise diet to begin with uh, stress management to begin without even talking about uh, drugs or peptides or anything if you don't get that under control those things won't work or like a small fraction of what you would expect so it's really anti-aging is really multifactorial and that's you know i think we found so far nine pathways totally independent to aging and i think that's only the beginning
Okay. So having said that the, the research on Epitalon, this most recent study hasn't yet reported no, their no, findings. It, exactly. I'm, and uh, and then are are there are you impressed with the research overall on Epitalon as an anti-aging peptide? And are there any other anti-aging peptides that you well, feel um, uh, do, uh, do work well? <laughs> I, I, I was back then very impressed and still am because uh okay when we started can lab i think it's over six years ago we only had three peptides and the first one that on the list was epitalon i said this one has to come out and then bpc and tb4 those were the only three peptides we started with uh oh interestingly Time is in beta four anti age. Okay, yeah. To to close on epitalon, and we'll come back if you want. Uh, yeah, because that's where my mea culpa is on epitalon in particular. But uh, uh, well, it's more of a technical. But to make a long story short, there is this researcher in last year published an article on time is in beta four. And uh, I'll send the link for you and the people who listen to, to read because it's, I, I find it uh, refreshing in a way. I'll explain why. The guy has done quite a few studies already on time as in beta 4 and specifically uh, on the heart regeneration uh, after a stroke, after uh, whatever condition of the heart and found, yeah, it works great. And, and see, that's the, for many years, it was pinpointed on time as in beta four for the heart. And there, that uh, article, I'm sorry, uh, I have a little thing in my mouth and turns out white on my lips. Uh, for many years, that was the only thing he saw, but it seems that suddenly he kind of broadened his mind on it and it's kind of an uh, enlightenment for the guy and it's refreshing to read this conclusion because he say oh that peptide probably has the same uh, activity in uh, other tissues and then it kind you know it's not written like that but it's like oh that could be an anti-aging peptide <laughs> it's regenerate organs mm -hmm. And uh, actually, the title of the study is Timazin Beta 4, uh, a new peptide. I, I, I'm not sure I use that term. But and what the, the way it describes it in the title, it's a peptide that reminds the heart of its native state. Mm. It's like it brings back the heart cells to exactly where they should be at their best when you're born, when you're, it's native, when it was made in the womb. Mm. So, and uh, it's very refreshing. And then you say, yeah, there must be other ones. Oh yeah, there is a bunch, you know, <laughs> you'll find them, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty amazing. Uh, and I, I, I had a sense of that back then. That's why I told you back then, Epitalon, TB4, and BPC. Uh, I believe they have a place uh, in, in an anti peptide anti aging program. And now we know more and more why. Okay. And is TB4 the same as TB500 or? No, no, no. That I've been debunking. Uh, uh, TB500 was. Uh, uh, trade name, uh, uh, product name, like uh, I don't know in the U.S., but I think you know uh, uh, a fridge. There was uh, a company, one of the early company that makes fridge, fri that was called Frigidaire. Uh -huh. So all the fridge, you would buy a new fridge independently of the brand and you would say oh i bought a fridge there uh -huh. uh, that was in canada that was it and i i don't know in the us so basically it was a, a brand name that was associated with a product uh 
right? It's like so, Z- Xerox became the word for yeah. Co- oh, I have a machines. Xerox in my office, and it's right. an IBM, you know. Right. So <laughs> it's not the name of the peptide; it's a brand name that was given to that peptide by one company, one of the earliest one to market it for horses, uh, and uh, it stick because you know it's like that. So no, it's uh, it it. it was in term of brand name mm-hmm. but it's not the the name of the peptide the name of the peptide is time is in beta 4 or one of its fraction because that same company kept the same name and switches first they were using a smaller fraction of time is in beta 4 later on they switched to time is in beta 4 but kept the same name TB 500, mm. uh, just to help with the confusion that we have today. Okay, so let's talk about TB4 and BPC 157. What are they doing in the body? Okay, uh, heal. Well, they're known mostly for healing and anti inflammatory effect, uh, but it's uh, it gets interesting when you start to see how they do it uh, uh, and that's why for example you say okay yeah it's great it heals the heart but when you look like that researcher when you look at how it does it then it's one of its function uh, action is to remind the heart of its native state. Now you're gonna ask me, how does it do that? Well, it turns out, and that's and that's again, that's a last year published, probably the finding as a few years. Uh, well, first an earlier finding, a time as in beta four is a big molecule, 43 amino acids. Uh, so in terms of peptide, usually you talk of peptide up to 50 amino acids. So 43, it's close to like, it, it is a big peptide, but it's like uh, a, a, a keychain. So where you have many keys and each key opens a different door. So time as in beta four as is like a keychain, uh, some part of the molecule or fractions uh, turns on those receptors and this one hook up to those receptors to do different things. So some researcher, they say, okay, let's find those keys. So they broke down time as in beta four. Okay, let's break it down here. Uh, like uh, dozens and dozens of combination of uh, fractions. And they say, okay, let's look in the predator. What does it do? And okay, this one, nothing, this one, nothing. Uh, they isolated four fractions. There may be more, we don't know, but what the fractions, the bunch they looked at, the uh, four came out. So they are like, they took the keychain and they took that one key out. Okay, this key does this, this key does this. And now we synthesize those four fractions. Uh, so one of the key specifically works on the heart uh, for some activity that I don't specifically remember. I don't have that much of a good memory. Uh, but one of the fraction, and that's where I come to uh, that Kavinson, uh review he did last year on his peptides, where he lists all the bioregulators. They didn't invent them, they discovered them because they existed already. Uh, and one of the peptides they list in the newer bioregulator, so to say that as a bioregulatory activity, is one of the fraction of time as in beta-4. Mm. And it turns out that it's small enough for amino acids like Epitalon, that probably it works like epitalon introduce itself in the cell to modify not 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 the sequence but the 3d thing uh you know the the, the uh, dna is a spiral and it can dilate and compress and twist and does that so epitalon and it 
seems like that fraction of time as in beta four does the same thing, introduce itself within the DNA, attach to it, modify the 3D structure of it, and the end result of that is an increased expressions of the genes in that part of the sequence. And that expression, they express proteins in the cells that are anti-aging like uh, P53 and you know all those anti-aging, P53, I think that's the protein that repair damage uh, proteins in the rest of the cells. So bang, it turns out that now we, hey, that's one of the way it works because when you take time as in beta four, the whole molecule won't, it's too big. It won't introduce itself in the nucleus but eventually your body will break it down to get rid of it. We have enzymes in the blood that do that. And one of the fraction it's gonna break down will be that fraction and oh, then it will go in the cell to do those. It's a bit speculative, but it's what, it's what I call the educated guess. You know, it makes total sense that it would work uh, like that. And that's the conclusion. Uh, it seems Kavinson came up with. Uh, and if he published it, probably he has some uh, hard evidence of it. You know, they do not compare stuff uh, and uh, pretty advanced. So, uh, uh, tyrosine beta 4 regenerate organs and tissues. Uh, oh, yeah. And that fraction too now is used a lot for uh, it's anti fibrotic. So, fibrosis scars so a part of the healing process that fraction and highly anti-inflammatory actually i found by experience now that it's it dwarf all the other anti-inflammatory peptides that one is amazingly potent as an anti-inflammatory tb4 it's fraction if you want only the anti-inflammatory antifibrotic and probably anti-aging you would use that fraction would, now, would, would tb4 as in its whole form have the same effect or do you need just the partial component it would because eventually it will break down it into those partial but it all then it comes down to what you want if you want the whole array of actions then you use the whole molecule but I would say if you want uh, the anti-inflammatory, anti-fibrotic effect specifically, okay, let's say you injure a tendon, right? Or a ligament or something highly inflammated. So there are phases in, in the healing of that. The first phase is, uh, oh, sorry, uh, that here. The first phase, is inflammation that you know it's gonna swell let's say the elbow is gonna be big like that so the first thing you want to do is bring down the inflammation so then you could use the specific one for inflammation why because milligram for milligram it's 10 times more potent mm -hmm. than time as in beta 4. so it has two advantages. One, you pinpoint what you want to do. And two, technically it's 10 times cheaper to do so. Right. So, and why is that? It's easy. That's a four amino acids. So by weight, and I did a calculation, it's 10 times lighter. And you know, if you don't, if you didn't miss that chemistry class, uh, it's you make a calculation so one milligram of this one that weighed this and one milligram it's you 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 have 10 times more molecules per right. milligram so right 10 times the punch 10 times everything plus an extra thing added and they found in the study those fraction as a even greater affinity for those receptor than when it's attached to time as in beta four okay because it's smaller, introduced easier. That's a part of biochemistry I'm not very educated on, but they found better uh, 
uh, attachment to the receptor. So even more efficient if you use the specific fraction. And then after that, it's the actual healing of the tissue. So then you could use that other fraction of thymazine beta-4. You don't need so much the uh, anti-inflammatory effects. So now you pinpoint that healing. And again, you get the same thing. More punch for your money, cheaper uh, therapy, and you do that. Uh, so it increases your scope of uh, actions, as pinpointing um, what you do. Now, I'm not uh, a big believer in too much pinpointing in a complex process like healing. So I still believe you should use a time as in uh, beta-4 as a base mm -hmm. to those therapy and spike those effects at certain moments with those peptides. So let's say the first three, four days, or as long as the inflammation is there, you use thymazine beta-4 and the anti-inflammatory fra uh, fraction. Then when it's time to, uh, to, uh, to heal, then you spike with the healing fraction but still use time as in beta four to get some anti-inflammatory, some of this, some of that. Mm -hmm. So by itself, it became one peptide that you can do so many things. It's amazing. And basically I would say that any condition from healing tissue to Lyme disease to neurodegenerative, time as in beta four is always used in I think I mentioned it, it's almost, I call it a more improved peptide. You know, your practitioner, somebody shows up with a condition, you don't know what it is, give him time as in beta four, more than 90% of the time, it's gonna improve the condition anyway, even if you have no clue how or why or what it is. Got it, because it's it's basically like an all-purpose tissue is tissue healing stimulator. It's it's stimulating the healing and regeneration of tissues. It does everything, it heals the nerve tissues, uh re it does re myelinations of nerves. Mm, ah, wow. You know, neurodegenerative, there is a demyelinization of in some cases of the nerves. Mm -hmm. It provokes remyelinization of those nerves. It's a bit like the aspirin, you know, when they discovered aspirin back then, it was like, you take aspirin for everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got it. So uh, one, one other question, um, I remember, I've used BPC-157, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Uh, for this purpose, for, for healing injured tissues. I've had a couple injuries uh, in my shoulder and my knee that I wanted to use um, BPC for. And I know many people stack BPC-157 with TB4. Uh, yeah. However, I remember looking into the research a bit and not using TB4 because I was concerned that it might contribute to cancer. There was some research that I remember discussing yeah, the, 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 the angiogenesis. Yeah. Well, I remember discussing a, one paper with you in particular, where I think they were showing that the, there's a higher presence of TB4 at the site of the cancer. And it was unclear whether that TB4 was there to combat the cancer or it was there and it was some, somehow facilitating the growth of the cancer. So do you have any sort of insight? Well, on, you know, there, there is a very, very high correlation between uh, house fires and the presence of firemen. <laughs> <laughs> now, what will you conclude out of that? Well, of course, we are, know. Are that they, 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 you know, are yeah. they responsible for the fire? Right. Or are they there to fight it? Right. That's so. That's the question: Is TB that is TB okay. four there to fight it or or not? I think they found one pro cancer activity, but that they found in the petri dish, right? Mm -hmm. So, 
that again, if somebody who has done research, it makes you look at this under a different angle. Uh, there are a question of degrees. And when you look at some a drug or a peptide that has multi activities, you have to look at everything. And that's harder to see because to measure, but the degree and you may have, okay, like, no, it's not the same, but you know that thing lately about antioxidant, turns out they're not so good for us, mm -hmm. but they're good because of uh, hormosis, you know, like it makes our body react to them and then stronger to, you get a, posit a net positive effect, even though locally you have a negative effect. So if you have different activities that, one compound has and yeah many times you'll see a pro-cancer activity but then you say but wait up then on the other side through other pathways it's anti-cancer so now the question is oh which one wins which one has the net strongest effect and the total effect is, is the molecule by itself anti or pro-cancer see they didn't made a direct correlation between cancer and the presence of thymus and beta-4. They just looked into deeper and I think they found, okay, through that pathway, it has pro-cancer activity. But then you wonder, you say, okay, but why in other cancers uh, you see higher level of thymus and beta-4 or you use thymus and beta-4 and it helps in the healing process or killing of the cells, whichever way you look at it. Well, it turns out that clinically I've been uh, consulting and working with doctors for a long time. And when I said thymosin beta-4 was used as a base peptide in basically all therapies, that included cancer. And they didn't, they never found an increase in cancerous activity when they used time as in beta four in, in real life, clinically, they see a positive effect from using it. So it's, uh, it's empirical, but empirically, we see that no, it doesn't aggravate the cancer. Excellent. That's the real test. That's great to great to hear. Yeah. It's nice to have a conclusive answer. You just you just now well, again, it's you empirical, you know, I don't have papers to show for it. But uh, if you would ask to any clinician, and there are quite a few now, mostly in, well, in Canada, but they're really uh, like under the radar, uh, you know, Health Canada and all that. But in the US, it's uh, so far, they're still uh, more free to do uh, that, those kind of things. Plus, in general, uh, when you talk, I think it's at stage four of cancer some people they call it the lucky stage even if it's like very serious but they call it the lucky stage because that's a stage i think there is a directive by the uh, medical associations and all that they say okay at that stage let them do what they want because we kind of we cannot do any more ourselves. So there is nothing to lose trying alternative medicines and all that. So from stage four, any doctor will kind of agree with anything you'll bring up uh, to use because they are, they're stuck. So they say, okay, right. why not try this then? Right. Got it. Um, so talk to me about BPC. What, what, what is the it sounds almost like you're more high on TB4 no, than you no, are on I like I like both both of them almost equally, but for different reasons. Okay. Uh, BPC2 is a healing peptide. It's a much, much smaller molecule. Basically, I always, I would always use them together because they kind of complement themselves in their healing capacity. 
And I, I would say by it's that healing capacity that brings about the regenerative of uh, uh, tissues. Okay, let's say you take it for your elbow, but the peptide goes around. So yeah, it will reach your liver, your heart, your lungs and everything. So if there's something wrong there, oh, it's gonna uh, fix it uh, at the same time. And, and you see that often, you know, you take uh, BPC because you hurt again your elbow but you had a nagging pain in your shoulder and oh, that's gone too, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's not specific to the area. So, uh, yeah, they complement, they work, uh, they complement themselves because they work through different pathways. So you attack the problem through different angles. So more angles, uh, better healing, and it's kind of synergetic and there uh, those healing effect. Uh, I would, Use it for anti-aging, not continuously, but you know, four or six times a year for short times, you know, to regenerate, heal little things that you may not even know about. What, uh, what, uh, just real, real, real quick. So four to six times a year. So like every other month, you would use it for, for how long? Example, a, a week, maybe a month? For uh, uh, sadly, because it's it's uh, it's. It can be uh, budget driven. So I would go for 10 to 20 days. Okay. You know, depending again, uh, budget being a factor, uh, but I think 10 days would be uh, sufficient. Okay. So get that's, base. That, that's for using BPC or BPC and TB4 together or th the same? The same if you of... use it for anti aging purposes, I will alternate. Alternate so between BPC do, and TB4? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, and I say uh, like every two months, but actually you would be, uh, you would take two weeks, let's say 15 days of uh, BPC 157. Then let pass six weeks, then do another two weeks or 10 days and let pass six weeks and five days, you know, something like that. So to have a complete two months with that, short therapy of uh, peptide and if it's purely for anti-aging you don't really look at the complementary uh, effect because you're not like healing big injuries or nothing just little patches here and there so they work well by themselves to do that so you know i would alternate so the first i would do tb4 maybe 10 days or 15 days then ppc then tb Nothing stops you to use them together. Again, budget driven. Uh, if you can afford it and it's cool for you, yeah, you do it together. And instead of every two or blocks of two months, you could do blocks of three months. Or if your budget allows it, two months. I, I wouldn't go, uh, the, 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 the lower I would go would be like short, like that 10 day things per month. Okay. I wouldn't do more than that. I don't see it necessary. Let, let's let me just ask the question so that I can sort of understand what why these time frames. Just to take it to this extreme, why not be on BPC and TB4 all the time, every day, 365 days a year? Well, empirically, we found that after a few months of continuous use, you don't the body kind of say, well, it doesn't. Uh, respond so well mm. uh, it, and we've seen that in, in therapies like life-threatening degenerative disease you know somebody has ALS uh, look he's gonna die in six months so we are not gonna take breaks so even in those cases we found out that yeah it's we take breaks and usually it's every it depends on the people but between two and three months, we start to see a decrease in effects. So we take a few weeks breaks, two, three weeks, then start again and bang, it's back on. So uh, there seemed to be a limit to how much, how long you can take without losing the full effect. Okay. So to take advantage of that, to always have full effect, then, you know, have breaks. Okay. And if, and if budget, if budget wasn't, uh, an op if budget wasn't a limitation in any way, 
what would be the i and you were trying to use these okay, to, to heal want, injuries okay you would uh if you would want to go to the full extent of an anti-aging therapy like you know you're you're in the prime mind frame that i don't want to die ever okay i would say 20 days out of the month take 10 days a month break you know it's gonna be good you will live forever you know, <laughs> you know that that 10 days actually could that extra that 10 days could become counterproductive on the long term so yeah. you better take the break and have full effect 20 days a month no problem okay for both being on bpc and tb4 together that's right okay got it and that's the like full budget no problem and i go for it and okay. probably uh, what i would do personally in that case again that's not a prescription or uh, i would do like a milligram of each per day uh, per day yeah a, mil a milligram okay okay so um one thing i want to make sure that we're getting across to people is just the kinds of results that people are noticing so um, I've heard many, many examples of seemingly almost miraculous healings of people using BPC or BPC and TB4 together uh, for healing injuries, even, you know, severely injured ligaments and tendons, as well as also gut issues. Can you comment on just some of the, the sort of the real life anecdotes that you've heard people report using these compounds? BPC-157. Uh, Crohn disease, not cured, but full remission. Wow! Uh, in three months. Wow! With only BPC one five seven and high dosage of uh, glutamine, a lot of glutamine. It's kind of the break of the uh, intestine. So mm -hmm. now you have the mortar and the break together. It works amazingly mm -hmm. good. Usually, if you have a proper peptide protocol for healing, what I've seen in general is, okay, let's say you break a bone. Uh, I, I, I won't be able to tell you how long it's going to take to heal. You know who's going to tell you? It, 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 it's the doctor that uh, fixed it, you know, put a cast or all that, because they have seen hundreds of the same injury. So they have a very good idea. Okay, that, you know, it's gonna be healed in 12 weeks. And that's pretty much it. So then you use that 12 weeks and if you use a peptide, a good protocol, cut that time in half, wow. basically. Wow. And now you know how high level athletes that everybody thought were would never go back to play that season are back in three weeks. Wow. Yeah, other, pro, uh, pro, uh, pro athletes are obviously using uh, BPC and, uh, and TV4 all the time, right? And and you know they do because now it's banned by uh, WADA. <laughs> right. So it's it's a proof of concept, I call. You know, if you want to know if something works, look on that list. If it's on the <laughs> list, that's because it works. <laughs> yeah. If it's banned by what what is for people that don't know the the what what's the right word for it? The organization that regulates what substances can be used in professional sports or or even call or it <laughs> yeah um so obviously steroids are banned many other performance enhancing drugs and many peptides um that's a shame no, if it didn't work they wouldn't care to ban it you know right so. right okay so um oh uh back to epitalon uh -huh. and bioregulator uh this is my big my, I take it personal. I wasn't the, actually most of the peptide community, we made the same mistake, but I, I, I did too. And it's me talking. So I take it. Uh, dosages, anti-aging protocols. It turns out that the initial studies were in Russian and sometimes badly translated or yeah. not well understood. Yeah. So for a while they say, oh, they wrote micrograms, but probably they meant milligrams Ooh. because at the time it wasn't 
but then you would read the text and it wouldn't make sense if that was the mistake, but it was kind of overlooked. Well, it turns out that, okay, when they first discovered the, those peptides, what they actually discovered are gland extracts that contain those peptides. And they saw amazing result with the concentration of those gland extracts. Then they say, okay, what makes it work? And then they found that one or two peptides within the extract that had that effect. Now, the first extract was called epitalamine, out of which they found that the active peptide was epitalon. But for the longest time, we interchange those terms. When we would read the epita epitalamine, we would say, okay, it's epitalon and the other way around mm -hmm. if you want it. So in the first extract, when the extract was used, they were using 10 milligrams of epitalamine. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that's equivalent. And there is one study that they say, okay, uh, 0 0.1 milligram, 100 microgram of epitalon was the active compound. Uh -huh. But for the longest time, we say, okay, 10 milligrams, epitalamine, epitalon. So the protocol is 10 milligrams of epitalon. No, it turns out it's 10 milligrams of the extract. The same thing with timaline, which is the extract, 10 milligrams. But what's in it, it's timogen. And clinically, it's sold in Russia as a medication. It's 0 0.1 milligram, mm -hmm. 100 times less. So again, that's great news, actually, because it makes it literally 100 times cheaper to do uh, uh, a pitalon thing or any bioregulator thing. Now, it makes it amazingly affordable. Uh, and if you look in the research deep enough and look at, you start to have that in mind, difference between epitalamine and epitalon, it's going to jump in your face. You say, oh, how could I miss that? Uh, actually, a few people didn't miss it. And if you go on Reddit, there is this German guy. Uh, it's Reddit, so... Uh, who knows what's his real name, but he, uh, he had a small group there and is doing good things in Europe in terms of testing products and all that. And he brought it up and he said, oh, and there wasn't, you know, people wouldn't react to it because it's too big to believe almost. It's like, no, come on, how could we be that wrong for so long? Right. Well, we were. <laughs> I was too, uh, yeah. but no, it's not. It's uh, now, you'll see most of the peptide companies, they, they won't tell you that because they're making a bunch of money uh, selling the 100 milligrams vials. Right. So they won't say, oh, no, you only need uh, one milligram. Well, the good, uh, the, good the, news is, the good news is that the 100 milligram vial will last you 100 times longer now at the proper dose. Yeah, but then for that, if you unless you use it 100 days, or uh, no, actually a thousand days mm -hmm. uh, in a row by that thousand day. Uh, yeah, you will see some degradation of the peptide. Right. So it's not practical to, to buy a hundred. Uh, and again, I won't lie about that. Uh, now we sell 20 milligrams vials, but we made that decision before I found, you know, I, I realized that. So it was a coincidence. It's but now we make 20 milligrams, which is still too much. But yeah, it makes it uh, more proper for you buy one vials and you're good for a few months. And for anti, okay, to come back to Epitalon, now the protocol I suggest, and it's a bit, even myself, it's a bit, uh, I'm still attached to that 10, 5, 10 milligrams a day thing. Mm. Uh, I still, uh, to be on, on the safe side, even when the science is clear on it, I still go for one milligram a day. Mm -hmm. It's still like 10 times cheaper for somebody. Again, the money is not such a problem. 
one milligram a day, you have plenty. And okay, again, to go to the full extreme, the, the basic protocol, actually, the cheapest one you could do is 0.1 milligrams a day for 10 days, twice a year. That's what the study showed those results. They never did a study with more. So I like to think if you take more, you may have better results, but the it showed. So that, that would be the basic to duplicate Kevinson results that are amazing already in terms of health and improvements of all the markers they looked at independently of the uh, telomere. But they and and, and are, there, are there new studies beyond the ones that happened 20, 30 years ago that have shown benefits from epitalon? Because I, I looked on, on uh, PubMed and Google Scholar, I didn't find much. No, the, the, the interest in those peptides is anti-business. Come on, again, you know, all, all research now is uh, business driven uh, a lot. Uh, what's the point to restudy something that would be so cheap so non-patentable, you know, what's the point? Mm -hmm. To spend a lot of money to do research that at the end would be purely, because pure intellectual research just for the sake of the advancement, you know, that, you know, when you do research, you're like, you stand on the shoulder of a giant, you know, you just, it seems like maybe what you did is nothing, but you know, you make the giant little by little taller. Uh, so nobody so far thought, okay, let's look into it and see if it's really what it is. Uh, and, and actually, if they don't, what it tells me that is that they know it, works you know they looked at the initial studies and it's sound it's like solid and they say we don't want to prove that to reprove that mm. and then how the fuck i'm gonna sell this molecule that is a drug and that's gonna be patented and billions of dollars will at the end will be made with that new drug it's sad to say but you know that's that's what i see yeah, so my, you know, maybe I'm I, wrong, but that's I, what I see. You know, I've been a, a science geek all my life since I was a little kid, and I, I always had this kind of now I realize very naive conception of of science. You know, that it's just all these kind of brilliant scientists who are altruistic, who are trying to just sort of make the world a better place. And there's just endless money that people are funneling to these scientists to find cures to disease and you know, and, um, you know, of course, there are very smart scientists and very good hearted altruistic people involved there. But I have been shocked, particularly in the last two years to discover that just how naive I was in my worldview, and, uh, and how much of science is, is so unbelievably corrupted by by financial interests. And it's been a really shocking and, and unfortunate realization for me. I have some friends who I think like you have been aware of this for a much longer oh, time. I, I than, shared than I quite have. a few of your posts on Facebook. <laughs> yeah. I, I love your writing, by the way. Thank you. I appreciate that. But um, yeah, to, to your point, I, I might have been skeptical a couple, more than a couple of years ago. I might have been skeptical of what you just said. But now, you know, seeing the last two years, I'm like, yeah, absolutely. You know, that the whole field and of science what is we so corrupt. see right now, it's what I call placement. Mm -hmm. Something big is to happen. They're just placing pieces. Yeah. It's not what it seems at all. Right. Yeah. I, I, I know time is running. Uh, just a personal thing here, but that would be of general interest. Yeah. Uh, there is that peptide now that's been used for a few years for uh, diabetes. It regulates uh, glucose uh, amazingly. And it's a bit paradoxical, and it makes us look now at glucose control from a different view because it's a glucagon analog. Mm -hmm. So the peptide that does the inverse of uh, 
insulin. Uh, insulin. But it turns out that by true mechanism, it regulates glucose level amazing. Mm-hmm. It's probably right now one of the best uh, glucose uh, medic. It's sold under prescription in the US and Canada for that purpose. But now it was repurposed and it's not sold because, okay, maybe not, maybe I did in your podcast, I don't remember, but in a few other podcasts I've been asked, is there a good peptide to lose weight? And my answer was, truth is, not really. And I would then always say, the day there will be one, you'll know, because just watch me. I, I, I'm kind of you know, overweight, so I'm ashamed of it. But uh, hey, I'm losing weight now. You are. That yeah, peptide, I, noticed, I noticed it instantly. That peptide works. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, Dan Stickler. Uh, very prominent uh, doctor in the that community, medical doctor out of Texas. Yeah, I've interviewed he him used, on the podcast as well. He used to be uh, exclusively in the fat loss business. I think he, he would even do the surgery himself, you know, the, 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 the stomach cramping and all that. I think it's in 2009, he gave up. He said, look, nothing works. Uh, I've tried everything. Yeah, they lose weight six months after they gain it back. Nothing works. I give up. Then he shifted his practice to what he does now. Except that in another podcast, he, he, now he changed his mind since that peptide came out. He said that's uh, he calls it uh, a paradigm change. He said like it's wow, not that that works. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ozempic. It's uh, uh, said glutamine. Uh, it works. Uh, um, uh, you're going to appreciate that. Uh, do we still have time? Like five minutes? Absolutely. I, I would. I would love to take more time because there's there's more topics. If you if you have more time to spare, I would. I would oh yeah, to- sure. Hey. Okay. okay. You know, uh, evolution. It, it's sorry. Uh, excuse the expression. It's a bitch. Uh, we're stuck with two hundred years of evolution. So for the biggest part of it, food was scarce, right? Mm -hmm. So our brain, our primitive brain, it's like sex, you know, it's at one point, it's you cannot control it, you know, it has to happen. So uh, you have to mate. It's in the primitive brain, it's actually survival, you know, the two instinct, uh, survival uh, of the species and of the individual. Those are two primal instincts. So in our survival instinct is basically it was imprinted in our brain. You see food, you eat it mm-hmm. because tomorrow it might, it will not be there most of the time for those couple of hundred years. You know, for sure, you, tomorrow they won't be. So you see it, you eat it. Mm-hmm. That's still there, except now food is there all the time. So we eat all the time. It's... Uh, for, and for people, it's stronger than other, but those, and they will openly say it, I control my hunger. So why do you need to control something? Uh, so that means that's not natural. And it turns out it's not. We're programmed to eat. You see food, you eat. You know, that's very basic. And it turns out that peptide works in the brain to cut off that signal. So. Uh, because what triggers that is uh, your blood sugar levels and a bunch of other things. And before we would play with those things, you do a keto diet, you do this, you know, to, to play with those things that would signal to your primitive brain, oh, okay, now you're full or whatever, you have this, you have that. Uh, for example, there are studies showing by just supplementing with uh, the right vitamins and minerals, hunger would go down because now you give the body what was missing. So the brain says, okay, now I'm good. But if you constantly lack of those uh, nutrients, your brain sends, even if your stomach is big like that, your body didn't yet get what it needed. So you're going to keep eating. So uh, that, that peptide somehow block that signal, send a signal to your brain. No, no, you're good. You know, that it, it would be like if it was for sex, it would be like a castrating agent uh, in the brain. Say, no, no, right. you don't need sex anymore. You're good enough for like uh, the rest of your life. 
<laughs> it explains ca cases. Yeah. So yeah, it does that. It so the end effect is it cuts appetite. You're basically never hungry. You go on a fast. You take that. You won't even realize you're fasting. Wow. Uh, and when you eat. And me, I, I was that kind of people that I love food and my, my girlfriend uh, cooking. So I was the kind of guy to take a second plate often. You, you know, yeah. no, with that, and it's sad. Actually, it was sad a little while ago for me because I was in Europe, in France, and uh, Latvia, great food, great restaurants. <laughs> and in I could never finish my plates. I was wow. full half plate, a third of the plate. Wow. And I would look at the food. As, no dessert ever. I never would get there. It was and it was a bit sad thing because I knew what I was missing in terms of pleasure of eating those food, but it works that good. It, wow. It's pretty amazing. What's the name of this peptide? Uh, the commercial name, if people in the U.S., they ask their doctor and... It, I know in Canada recently they accepted it for weight loss, actually, so they can prescribe it for that purpose. But it's already prescribed in the U.S. for uh, diabetes and blood, uh, hypoglycemia and all that, anything related to uh, blood glucose. So it's kind of easy nowadays for most people to justify that with a blood test. Uh, so it's covered because it's quite, you know, Again, it's a peptide that is synthetic, doesn't occur in it, that form in the body. So there is a patent on it. So they're making about, I think it costs between a thousand and two thousand dollars a month if you uh, you have to pay for it. And we're talking it, one it, shot a week. It, it's it, a daily thing. Right. If if you were to get it prescribed by a doctor and get it via the, that pathway, it would cost that much? No, that's the price if you don't have insurance, because I, I was in the U.S. Uh, in October and uh, I had Matt to prescribe for me. He did. I went to the pharmacy and, you know, not being American or no American insurance or nothing. Uh, they told me the, the price I would have to pay. And I said, no, I'm not paying that for a peptide when I have a company that makes them. So I'm. So we made some for personal use. Sadly, we cannot commercialize it because, because it's patented. It's, it's patented, and right. we stay away from those. Uh, a couple of years ago, we commercialized uh, a peptide like that, SS31. It took only a couple of months to get a letter from some lawyers in Boston. You know, a cease and desist thing or otherwise uh, they would come strong on us so we stopped right. and we learned our lesson so too bad made some for myself it works great but it is available on their prescription uh, any sound doctor will prescribe it because basically no side effects uh, it seems like this is it and it some new studies show that it even works at blood glucose regulation in the brain. Mm. Now, relate that to some uh, people, scientists, call Alzheimer diabetes type 3. Yeah. Because they saw a very high correlation between blood glucose dysregulation in the brain and Alzheimer. Mm -hmm. So it's even good for that. And actually the more studies are done and on other effects, it turns out, okay, when I got, and it's ridiculous because I was only 20, 19, 20, when I started to look into anti-aging, I bought a book back then. It was, uh, it was called Life Extension. You can still find used copies on uh, uh i'll send you a link again if it's possible for you if people are interested it's sure. like it's a bible and it was written at the beginning 82 and the those guys you know california san francisco hippie movement you know out of the EP and all that doing all those crazy stuff they talk about nootropics anti-aging vitamins and stuff and a few 
uh, chemicals, drugs at the time, they were very in advance. But the, the conclusion you get from reading that book, and that comes out today too, but it's not so obvious, is that aging, you need to control only two things. You need to control uh, uh, inflammation, systemic, and you need to control glycemia, mm. blood glucose. Everything, most of everything you do, unless, you know, with the bioregulators where you really go, it's bioregulator, it's basically epigenetic, uh, manu it's not genetic manipulation, it's epigenetic manipulation. You promote uh, uh, a gene, gene expression positively. So it's good epigenetic manipulation. Next step will be uh, genetic manipulation. And that scares me uh, for the political and ethical uh, reasons. Um, so basically, that's what you need to control. And now we find new approach, but what you see at the end, that's what you're controlling. Inflammation and uh, uh, glycemia. You control that, you got aging. That's the base you should. And that's why diet, exercise, stress management, that's what they work on at the end of the day to control those two things. Okay, so so going back to to weight loss peptides, um, first of all, just really quick, what wh what is the name of the peptide that you were talking about? The glu glucagon analog, set glutamide. Set, I think. S E T or S E P. <laughs> There's an had a very bad night's sleep, so <laughs> let me go. Um, I'll, let me Google it. So I, I won't make a mistake. But if you Google funny, it, that's funny you, you know how to synthesize it in a lab from scratch. Semaglutide. But, but semaglutide, because said glutamide is 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 another one not so good. Uh, sema S E M A G L U T I D E. Semaglutide. Uh -huh. It's funny that you have the sophistication to be able to synthesize the peptide in a lab, but you can't remember the name of it. <laughs> and that's rare because, you know, I don't have such a good memory. I'm not like some of those that remember articles and names and all yeah. that, but I don't feel bad about that. You know, mm -hmm. once they asked uh, Einstein, they wanted to, to they, they, oh, what's the speed of light? And he said, well, I don't know. <laughs> but then he said, listen, why should I remember something that I can look up easily? Uh -huh. And that was pre-computer and internet day. Yeah. As well. Yeah. So you may have a great memory. Uh, me, I think, and that's what differentiate uh, uh, people don't see much. It's not, I, I think intelligence is not your capacity to recall things. It's it It's great. I wish I had like those photographic memories and all that, but you can have the best memory. I think the intelligence, it's the way you make connections between Absolutely. what Agreed. you remember. Agreed. That doesn't occur that often. Yes. Agreed. So uh, as far as weight loss peptides, other than this one, it sounds like you're not really uh, a big fan of the effectiveness of other peptides. I know there are many people who talk about some of the growth hormone secreting peptides as far as uh, epimorelin, tesamorelin, MODGRF, CJC. Yeah, it will work. Okay. Uh, in uh, older people, because many times, and that goes for uh, testosterone replacement therapies, because they're replacing something, uh, when they start to using, they're replacing something that's not there anymore. Mm. And that what was there anymore uh, before was enough to maintain their body weight, their fat percentage, their muscle mass. So now you're slowly losing testosterone, you're slowly losing growth hormones and the byproduct IGF-1 and uh, that. So slowly you see in older people, 
they lose muscle mass, they increase their fat mass. Mm -hmm. They start to just to supplement enough. That's why they call it replacement. You don't use more than what you used to make. You mm -hmm. just, that's why when you do a, a replacement therapy, don't look at the numbers of people your age, you know, like as a standard, because all, all those people are down too. No, look at youthful level. Mm -hmm. What's the range, uh, the levels for, let's say between 25 and 30. That's the, the levels you should aim at because those are the youthful level. That Those are the levels that maintained and gave you your optimal muscle mass and fat level. The one that hopefully at that time you are not obese and all that. Let's say you were healthy, doing some sports and all that. Mm -hmm. So those are the level. So you reach 50, 40, 50, 60, hey, those levels are way down. So yeah, you got fat and everything. So you start to replace, to bring back those levels to youthful, that's going to come back. So that's why sometimes, you, you know, you always, who's taking it? Okay, the guy is 50, change his life, of course. Now it has youthful level, so all those things came back to mm -hmm. when he was 30, let's say. Mm -hmm. But that's why, too, they're not so great. If you're an overweight person, you're 30, and you over what you produce already, well, those may be declined because of many uh, processes like aromatization of testosterone, so you make more estrogen, which decrease your testosterone uh, active levels and all that, yeah. But it's not a good idea to supplement with testosterone, even if it's low, because fat itself convert testosterone to estrogen. So if you take testosterone, you're just going to make more estrogen. Not a good idea. So no, you have to attend the problem to a different angle to begin with. But so you take a healthy person, healthy levels, and then they say, oh, so they see that study done on 50 and up people they gain a bunch of muscle. So, hey, if I take it, I'll gain muscle. They try it and they say, oh, no, it wasn't that great. See, it depends why and what's your condition to begin with. So in terms of supplement to enhance, so to say uh, performance or capacity or health or everything, uh, if you take those when your levels are basically good, so it brings you to uh, supra physiological levels. That's not a good idea because now you have, it's like an engine, you know, you rev up too high for too long. It's not good for the engine. You know, you, you deplete, uh, you start to deplete other things and that's not good. Uh, so that's why they're not that great. They don't work that good. If uh, let's say you're an athlete, you want to increase performance. You take those peptides, you know, don't count on that for things to happen. You know, you won't become Mr. Olympia only using peptides, forget about it. You know, they will help a little, but again, you're revving up things. So is that good on the long term? I don't think so. Just aim for optimal youthful level and within that normal range, well, aim for the upper third part of the range but still so, so, within the physiological levels so would it be fair to summarize that as far as the growth hormones sucretagog peptides are concerned you would say that their their primary benefit would be in more people who are above age 50 oh yeah then and the higher you go the more you're gonna he hear i hear it from people hey the lifesaver basically they were like going down big time and all the way up and fast mm -hmm. because suddenly yeah so well uh, growth hormone actually it starts slowly to go down uh, when you're 30 yeah it starts already <laughs> so but you won't see a real real effect i would say even like 40 uh, for a uh, growth hormone uh, uh, peptide supplementation, not too strong, not too big, but yeah, maybe around 40 would be a good age to start for anti-aging or healthy aging purposes. Got it. Okay. Um, 
Are there any peptides that you think would be uniquely helpful for someone suffering with chronic fatigue, chronic fatigue syndrome? That's much more complex and that could be a whole other podcast, but therapeutically with all the therapies of uh, clinicians, I'll call them because many times they're doctors, other times they're naturopath and all that, you know, uh, clinically what we, uh, we have seen where multiple approach are used. One approach that I would never go without now, it's called mineral rebalancing. Mm. Uh, and that's why that, that would be another podcast. I'm not very versed in that, but a few years ago I did study and I work with some of uh, the practitioners that do only that. It's amazingly potent. And Again, to make a long story short, let's say you're deficient in magnesium and magnesium is necessary to more than 300 enzymatic processes. Some of them are vital. That's why you go to a hospital, uh, magnesium level or low, it's life-threatening. Basically, they, they shoot you with magnesium uh, IVs. So, but your body is missing magnesium, but the enzymes, they're life sustaining. They need to go. So what will they do? They will replace the magnesium by a heavy metal that is plus two. So it will fit in the enzyme, mm. but it's not the right uh, uh, atom. So the enzymes won't have the exact perfect shape to fit in the receptors or to, to participate in the reaction in that case, sorry, not the receptor, but to fit in, you know, to, to have its activity. So instead of working at 100%, it's going to work at 40, 50, 60% of the enzymatic uh, reaction. So now you talk to me about chronic fatigue. Uh, I've, I was asked, you know, uh, checking with people who suddenly feel chronic fatigue, you know, and I say, when did it start? And they say, oh, it started uh, a year ago. And they say, is it what I ate during that year? I say, well, maybe you should look what you didn't eat for the last 40 years or 30 years mm -hmm. because that deficiency is, builds up. You know, when you're 20, you're missing. If your diet miss already magnesium, then you're maybe deficient 10%. But a deficient diet time over time, suddenly the deficiency is 20, is 30, is 40. And that's replaced by a heavy metal. And that's why I believe forced det detoxification is not good because now you may be taking heavy metal that now are life sustaining for you. It's, it's, it's not the best thing, but it's better than nothing. You don't have enough magnesium. Mm -hmm. So sometimes forced uh, detox can be life-threatening and you see it sometimes people they start to detox they have a huge bad reaction sometimes it's because you start to uh, eliminate too fast uh, toxins and all that but sometimes it can be life-threatening because of that so what you do and there is a science now that it's called it's not mineral supplementation because they found ratios between you can be deficient in magnesium not only because it's lacking in your diet, but for example, because you have too much calcium or you can be deficient in zinc because you have too much copper. You know, it's, uh, there is a balance between all those minerals that is optimal. So that science balances that and reestablish this. By reestablishing it, then your body senses it and you say, oh, I don't need that heavy metal anymore because now I have enough available magnesium. So the body starts to release it and we're equipped to detox naturally of it. Slowly over a few weeks, few months, you're going to detox naturally. And after a few weeks, a few months, you're going to start to work better. 
But now it turns out that a lot of the receptors for drugs, for hormones, for uh, peptides have minerals part of their composition. And the same thing happened there. So we found some therapies that work miracles with some people and would do nothing for other. And then we, I started, it was in a group, I started to send private messages and I asked them, what have you done? And for like chronic fatigue, Lyme and this and that. And I asked them, what have you done in the past few months and few years? before starting the peptides. And the common point of the people who had good results was that at some point within a year before, they did some form of soft detox mm -hmm. without knowing, maybe not the perfect one, but some kind of remineralization, balancing and uh, elimination of heavy metal. And it's, it's a known fact, uh, heavy metal uh, toxicity blocks uh, partially uh, uh, testosterone receptors uh, and uh, hormonal receptors. So, you know, you know uh, yeah, that, that's a classic one, but if, if uh, you have a fish in your house that's unhealthy, the first thing you look at is at the water, not at the fish. Yeah. So, you know, you have to look at those things first. Peptides are amazingly great, but they are another tool. So, you know, when you have something complex as chronic fatigue, don't look to fix it with a peptide to begin with. First, try to find why you have chronic fatigue. And then maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe, maybe a peptide will be adequate for your case. Maybe not. Okay. I, I, I agree completely with you. So let's say we're in the context of using peptides in some kind of supplementary role. Are there ones that come to mind that you think? Uh, the be... mitochondrial peptides, okay. uh, much C and uh, humanin. Okay. And, and SS31, do... one, one and week, how... uh, for the short few months, we sold it. <laughs> <laughs> and how do those work? At the mitochondrial level, it's different aspect. It's not all known. But basically, the okay, if you don't have problems, it falls into that category that if you take it, it revs up your mitochondria. You produce more ATP, like they go, gives you energy. It's like, whoa. So actually, it's not a good idea to do long term because you're going to like something will happen. You cannot rev up like that and cannot be good for a long term. So if you have actually even in a case, okay, and, but two, I'm a proponent of, let's say you have headaches. I, I will tell you, okay, let's find out why you have a headache, right? Uh, what's the cause? But today you have the headaches. I, if it's me, I'm going to take aspirins, believe me. And then I look why the headaches came up. So the same thing with peptides. So, okay, that may be not the cure to the why you have chronic fatigue, but it may help you to keep your head out of the water at least until you go deeper and find out why. So yeah, much C uh, would be the to-go peptide in that case. Okay, and have you seen Yes. Chronic, uh, reports from people that oh, yeah. that have used Motsi with chronic oh, yeah. fatigue. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It pulls them out of it most of the time. Wow. But again, eat. Okay. Again, either you're stuck taking Motsi all the time for the rest of your life because it's not going to cure it. Uh -huh. It's just going to pull you out, you know, like an aspirin will help with the headache. But and I mean, if you're a billionaire, you don't care spending all that money on one peptide and shooting yourself every day, and then the risk of overuse and all that is not a problem, then yeah, do it, you know, but that's you, and I don't suggest it. No, I say, okay, you could use it or uh, for a time, so at least you feel better and you're not harming yourself, but please look deeper into the causes of it and try to fix that. Mm -hmm. I agree completely. Um, very, very interesting stuff. Okay. Um, maybe two more topics, if we can quickly touch on them. One is, um, 
which one do I want to do first? Um, athletic performance, endurance. Are you aware of any peptides that have a role to play there? I know there's a Let's see. Know, Matsi again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's on the banned list of what. I'm... Okay, got it. And and that works. There's research supporting that it's effective. It's for on the list. Endurance. No, okay. no <laughs> studies proving, but it's on the list. So. And you've seen lots of people and, report. Uh, empirically. They're the first athletes actually were the first who came up with because there was no study done at all uh, in terms of, OK, what should be the dosage? Uh, they're the first one kind of through the grapevine to release dosages. You know, you take that much. And I know at the time it was two or three years ago, Tour de France, they were all, all on it. But lot, tested lot, already. Oh, yeah, of, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot that, of the athletes then, were on it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And a couple, you know, look at for endurance, look at Tour de France, they're the champion in, in that. Yeah. And champions in evading testing. <laughs> okay. And um, are, do you have any specific concerns around? I, I know you just alluded to this, but any specific things you're concerned about with long term use of MOTSI? In high dosage, yeah, you don't want to rev up. And maybe, okay, there is that one study that came out and they found out that, you know, those centenarians in Okinawa, they have abnormal eye levels for their age of Matsi. Oh, interesting. So that's why it's believed to be an anti-aging peptide. Uh -huh. But again, that's a discussion I had in another uh, uh, other podcast about the bioregulators. It's not because, you know, the way they work epigenetically is I strongly believe that we barely know all they do. Okay, one study was done on this peptide with its effect on the heart or that's a bioregulator for the liver. But if you look deeper, then you find that some of those peptides, even specific to an organ, they have effect on other organs. And you know that because for some reason, somebody studied it. And me, my intuition is those bioregulators, they have much deeper effect that we don't know about because nobody studied it, but that upregulate all those overall processes. And I wouldn't be surprised that if somebody one day decide to look at it, somehow, somewhere, those bioregulators, well, they regulate mutsi levels. Mm and human end levels and SS31 levels and this and that. But that would call for so many studies that it seems that only Kevinson in Russia is, and there is so many he can do. Uh, so that's why for a while I would consider it, but truly with time, I'm talking years, because you're talking of a long-term effect, I would, yeah, I could start an anti-aging protocol with including MUTC, a bit like BPC, maybe do 10 days uh, every two, three months, you know, just to upregulate a bit to have that, what seems to be an anti-aging effect. But slowly I would put more the weight of those effects on a sound bioregulator protocol and a bit of BPC and TB. And that, that's epitalon and anything else in that category of bioregulators? Well, as a base, as a, a anti aging and healthy aging that is proven, it was epitalon and timogen, mm -hmm. or the extract epitalamin and timalin. Mm -hmm. uh, those two as a base. Okay. Uh, and and that's it. Now, if you suspect, you know, by um, uh, heredity, you know, in my family, everybody had uh, heart problems, then there is a bioregulator for the heart. So, you know, you say, well, chances are, you know, a little problem there. So throw in that heart bioregulator. Uh, when you get older, there is a bioregulator for the prostate and one for uh, the 
testicle. So hey, why not throw that in? You know, then you can tweak with that too. You know, you, you find out that in your family, nobody ever had heart problems. So you know, chances are that you won't die of that. So, you know, don't push it on that side. But on the other side, they had the diabetes problem. So, hey, yeah, there is a peptide for the pancreas. So maybe throw that in in that those yearly cycles. And, you know, you can tweak with that a bit with your uh, family history, your personal history, and uh, try to influence that with those. Got it. Um, I have two more questions for you. One is on the other side of um, sort of athletic performance, body composition, any peptides uniquely effective for muscle gain? And then my last one is skin anti-aging. Oh, boy. Okay. Fast. (laughs) Um, you don't have to go in, in depth on muscle. No, no, games, exactly. But, uh, sport just, performance, yeah. uh, BPC and TB because they're repairing. Okay, mm-hmm. you train, you break down tissues, then once it's repaired, you build up, right? Well, it's one of the it, you can build muscle only uh, without breaking down, but that's only part of it, so you can build muscle by breaking it down then it rebuilds so if you are if you have that kind of heavy training then if you use bpc and tb and that's why it's on the list of wada two you that repairing part is shortened so you can train more often hence get more results faster Hence, it's muscle building in that sense. It helped the whole process. It's not anabolic as a steroid would be, like in its actual protein synthesis increased, but in the repairing part of the tissue and yeah, maybe a bit in the uh, protein synthesis part in terms of rebuilding the tissue to build more myelin and actin because the muscle is bigger, so you have more of those. So yeah, those actually those two would be long-term, they would be actually more potent than any uh, growth hormone, secretagogue and all that. Really? By the way, wow. one of the healing effects they found again last year is that BPC increases the receptivity of the growth hormone receptors. Yes. So that's one of the way it works growth hormone is repairing to an extent. So with the same amount of growth hormone you produce, you take BPC, suddenly that growth hormone is more repairing. So it's Mm -hmm. part of the many angles of uh, healing that is uh, increased. Excellent. And any other peptides worth mentioning as far as muscle gain? Uh, Look, it's again, it's more for older people. You'll see a, a drastic effect Un- unless you take the, the secreta guy like four times a day and some they do. So then that's going to bring your growth hormone levels to way over supraphysiological levels. And you will get uh, the, the muscle gain you would get from taking exogenous uh, growth hormone. Okay. But again, that's not that impressive at the end of the day. Uh, again, uh, you know, I've worked for many years with athletes and I've not known one athlete uh, striving only on, at the time, growth hormone. They tried it. It's mm-hmm. like, eh, uh, mm-hmm. not uh, too expensive, not worth it. Mm-hmm. It's Got no, it. no big deal. Okay. Last one is skin anti-aging. Any, any peptides good for that? GHK, okay. with or without copper. Uh, if it's uh, one doctor, Picard, that has over 20 years of research, is like the father of GHK. Kevinson in Russia once stated, oh, I wish I had discovered that peptide. Because it turns out, it turns on enough, but always for a positive outcome, more than 4,000 genes. Wow. So it's a very... Uh, epigenetic uh, peptide, three amino acids, like it's, it is a bioregulator, except it's not called like that because it's not discovered by Kevin Sanu kind of as a patent, I think, for the name or the copyright. 
So, but he said, I wish I'd discovered it. It's amazingly potent, uh, anti-aging, skin, uh, collagen, everything. And it can be applied on the skin. Now, the thing is uh, to work in many, not always, sometimes GHK, three amino acid works by itself in some processes, but many times too, it needs to be attached to a copper ion to work. Now, if you take GHK base, we'll call it, and it needs copper, then it will find, uh, Picard studies has shown it, empirically, it's not like in vitro, but they see that happening. It will find copper in the albumin in your blood. So mm -hmm. it will bind passively just to see it and touch, it binds. So then you have GHK copper in circulation and it's gonna be used up such as, so you don't need to inject GHK CU because it will become CU for what you need. And that's a good thing because injected, it's very painful uh, because of the copper. With other copper, it's painless. But if you apply it on the skin and it works, GHK will not find copper on your skin. So you need to use with copper, so it's attached and apply it on the skin and you have all the, the skin like collagen, uh, uh, increased uh, production, uh, healing, because it's healing, so of small scars and uh, all the, it's, uh, you know, uh, retinoic acid is, uh, for the skin, it's great for wrinkles and all that. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, if you compare GHK copper with retinoic acid, uh, retinoic acid has 60% of the effect of GHK with copper applied on the skin. So it's like almost twice as potent wow. for that purpose. Wow, amazing. Okay, so uh, Jean-Francois, thank you so much. This has been uh, You were amazing. asking at the beginning, I've been using it. <laughs> ah, that's why. So you, it's one you, of those things. You've lost weight from the glucagon analog peptide, and you've been using the GHK on your skin. That's why you look younger. Well done. You, you've thank you. In two years since I last saw you, you look five to ten years younger. Amazing. Well, again, something is working. Then. <laughs> yes. Yes. Awesome. It would be interesting and uh, to do another podcast on what I do, only me, uh -huh. yeah, my I protocols, would... peptides and others. I'm sure people would like that Let's because, you it. know, I'm very, uh, I've been in the field for like, actually, um, beginning of the eighties. And since yeah. then I've been taking, trying stuff, uh, you know, I have my own little protocols that have, are time proved and, so I'm, uh, if you feel that, you know, your crowd would be interested to know what I do, hey, that, that'd be cool. I, I'm, I'm up uh, to that. I uh, it love... won't be only peptides. Sometimes it's going to yeah. be a bit uh, scary and off the, <laughs> I, off I would the main roads. I would absolutely love to do that. And, you know, one big topic that we didn't touch on at all is SARMs and some of the related compounds, they're not technically we SARMs. We could talk but, about that too, but um, yeah, But sure. yeah, let's, let's do that. I'll email you right after this and we'll get it in the works. Jean-Francois, uh, thank you so much for all the extra time spending twice the allotted time doing this interview. I really appreciate it. Thank you for sharing all your wisdom with my audience. And uh, you know, as, uh, as a final word, one thing I know that is important to touch on that I should probably ask you to say a few words on is uh, the importance of quality peptides. You know, there, there are a lot of, um, I, I'll just say, you can go online, you can do a Google search for how to buy peptides and please be aware, everybody listening, there are lots and lots and lots of websites that are trash, that are scam websites or that are selling uh, Chinese peptides. And- Okay, straight up, yeah, yeah, you brought it up, Chinese. Listen, they mass produce, basically, that's what they do, everything, you know that. That includes peptides. It turns out that, and in the past, I wrote to companies. I say, you know, just to test them. Uh, and I know I knew they did, but hey, you say, I want a kilo of TB4. Oh, they say, yeah, we can synthesize it. We'll have it in a month. Well, that's what it takes to synthesize TB4. It's a big one, as I told you. 
but they will synthesize one batch of thymazine beta-4. So as by experience, you know, there is a mass effect, it's called, where, you know, you have the, it's not a synthesizers like those machines you see, the big, the blue something. They're amazingly, they're microwave synthesizer. You have like 99.9%. But if those company tells you they use that to make the peptides they're selling you, they're lying because those machines are amazingly good, but they can make only milligrams of peptides at the time. They cannot even make one gram. It's like 100, 200 milligrams. So now you're telling me you use that and you're selling hundreds of vials. I mean, you, you no, it's not, doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. It's like, if you tell me you, you have a restaurant and you're selling, uh, 3,000 burgers per day and you have one cook. Right. Something doesn't work out. Mm -hmm. So when they tell you they have that machine, they're lying to you that, no, they're just took the picture off internet, look our machine. No, they use reactors. And that looks, I think there is that little video I made, you see at the reactor and you see that and it's like what the fuck is doing alchemistry here it's like it's bubbling in there it's like it looks weird it doesn't look like those machines anyway it's in a, a round ball and it's brewing in there you know the the, the you, 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 anyway it's a long process but you know you you block one side and you throw the amino acid then it, it looks up you know it's a, it's a chemical reaction happening in there so it's like you have all those chemical things happening in there but there is a mass effect where the bigger that ball is, the more you throw in, but then the sheer weight of the mass that's on the upper level, a bit like pressure when you go into the ocean, creates a pressure on the lower part of the ball. And that increased pressure slows down or inhibit the right reactions. So basically you lose quality right off the bat when you make huge quantities in one shot. We found, for example, for BPCN type, as soon as we make more than 50 gram at the time, uh, purity goes down. So, you know, we limit, we stay there and we make more. Uh, but China, they don't care about that. They make one kilo, two kilo, all in the same ball, filter ship it out another aspect of it is when you buy a peptide it's not only the percentage of what you get that's important i a few years ago i bought ghk from china no not with copper the pure one and then we made it now you don't see that because you know it's a few milligrams and uh, pretty much all companies, they mix it up with mannitol. So then, you know, it's diluted with the white excipient. But if you look at the pure product and we tested ours and theirs, they were both 98.7% and not, same percent, like good quality, actually. If you only look at the percentage, but if you look at the powder, the Chinese one was yellowish. Ours is crystal white. Now, let me ask you, what's in that 1% that makes theirs yellowish and not ours? It should be crystal white. There is not. What you should worry about is not that 99% purity. It's that 1% impurity. Mm -hmm. Excuse, you know, what the fuck is in there that makes it not the right color. Now, we were not equipped to test for heavy metals and all that, but then there are studies, an FDA study uh, report where they tested the peptides out of China and they found, uh, ah, actually they found bacteria in it. And it turns out, I wrote, if you go on CanLab, just CanLab on Facebook, I wrote a short article with the article referring to that. If you look at the kind of bacteria they found in the vial, it's a bacteria that strives in the polluted water. So that tells you that they use not filtered 
pure water. They use like, I would say tap water to get those bacteria in there. So, you know, it's when you start to look into that, it's scary. And I find it funny because you, you go in groups and all that, and they say, oh, I get from China and, and I get good results. You know, they buy the raws and make their own little thing. And of course it's gonna work. They get like high percentage, but they are the same people that, for example, are anti-vaccine, not the latest one, but anti the vaccines they give to kids. Oh, because there is some aluminum in it. Uh, yeah, okay, they, they, they get like, a, a minute amount of aluminum in it given. And you think that one shot, one time aluminum thing that is nothing compared to the, the other ones you put on, under your wrestle every day that's full of it, aluminum. You think that one shot made your child autist, but you don't give a shit about taking a peptide every day for weeks and months coming out of China and you have no clue what's in that 1% and probably there is those heavy metals. It's like, come on, give me a break. You know, the only reason you take it is because it's cheap and you want to pay cheap while well, you get cheap. That's the end of it. Uh, sorry, I'm you know, a little upset about that because that's what people do and then they complain we're expensive and all that and no, we're yeah. not expensive at all. Yeah. And, and it's critically important, especially when you're talking about anything that's being injected directly into the bloodstream, any contaminants or bacteria. You bypass all your defenses. That's right. So it, it is critical if you're going to inject anything into yourself to get it from a quality source. Um, having said that, and I hope you don't mind me saying this, Jean-Francois, there are other reliable sources of peptides. There are um, high quality sources. You can go through a doctor. You can get it through companies, legitimate companies, like I think it's called TaylorMade. Uh, uh, they used to be. Oh, they I used think to be. they got some problem with the FDA. Uh, actually, we kind of got access to... Uh, it's a bit their fault. They, 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 uh, just warnings they got from the FDA. You know, the, the, uh, when you work and, uh, you know, it has to be GMP. So you get regular visits from, uh, FDA people to inspect facilities and all that little things. But, you know, they go, they will find something, you know, how you got, you know, clean this or that should be done this way. So they had warnings that they didn't care much you know they didn't correct so one after the other at one point the fda they say no come on uh, you cannot do it anymore oh so but they're shut down now taylor made no longer exists they they exist but now they make biological uh, no they make uh, peptides i think in uh, oral use so as a supplement so it doesn't apply to the same strict uh, fda okay. requirements i'm not sure exactly what they do and don't do anymore but i know the compounding uh, most doctors now they don't get from tailor made anymore okay i think they are very very limited in what they can do but they well, have other activities so are there there are maybe a couple other sources of peptides that are good and then there's i don't know if you want to mention them by name since you know more than i do but um and then i wish i could but when i was at the ipa conference international peptide society Back in 2019, you know, before when we could travel freely, uh, there was a lot of, uh, well, TaylorMade was there and there was like a f quite a few other uh, compounding pharmacies and they all told me the same thing independently, that's funny, that there was one supplier of raw peptide for all those companies and they were mad and looking for another supplier and that's why they approach us can lab because they found out that that main supplier was sourcing from china oh wow okay now with the gmp certification <clears throat> from china but that was good enough uh looking into it it's like yeah sure gmp you know china yeah 
Yeah. Uh, so they were pretty mad uh, at them and they were actively looking for uh, local, meaning North American source and they approached us, but we are into research. So we don't want to become GMP uh, because that would call for too much uh, government look over. And, and it's worth Which mentioning. Which indirectly means, sorry, sorry, means uh, big pharma influence on long term, you know, like, oh, uh, you know, for some stupid reason, like Taylor made, they shut you down, not for the real reason, but they come up with something. Yeah. Okay. So it, it's worth mentioning to be explicit. Um, and one question I wanted to ask you earlier. Oh, if you was... want to know research grade is better quality than human grade by okay. the way got it so i one of the one question i meant to ask you earlier is just you know if if there's all these compounds out there these this category of peptides that have all these amazing effects on our physiology how come so many people haven't heard of them before how come it took so long for, for people to hear about Bitcoins? <laughs> it's a menace. You say that in English? Menace? 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 Menace. menace. Yeah, I pronounced it in French. To the Bitcoin is a menace to the banking establishment. Mm. They know it exists. They're going to talk it down or they just will not talk about it. Big Pharma, they know very well about peptides. They know so well about it that they try to find way around patenting them. Now they patent the applications. So eventually they will have patents on those. They're working really hard on that. But at the same time, they tell you they don't work like time is in alpha one. That was sold in pharmacy up to beginning of last year. Coincidence, it's found to be one of the best thing you could take for COVID. Then FDA withdraw is uh, acceptation of it for human use and uh, forbid compounding pharmacy to compound it. Coincidence. Yeah. Do I need to say more? No, I don't think, I think that's sufficient. Um, okay. And so just one, one last comment on this. It, it's worth mentioning that for people who are new to this topic, that this category of compounds is essentially gray market, I guess you could say. It's for research purposes only. Um, Can Lab, Jean-Francois's company, sells these products for research purposes only, not for human use, because it's this category, uh, you know, basically legal category that if they were to sell them for human use, it would require a whole different kind of legal regulation and oversight over what they're doing. Um, you can technically get a prescription from a doctor. There are doctors that work with peptides who specialize in this area. You can get a prescription and get it from various sources that way. If you prefer to do things that way, that that is an option for you. Um, and can lab Jean-Francois's company, universally, everyone swears by it. It is uh, extremely good quality. I hope you can tell by his integrity and honesty during this podcast. He is an extremely high integrity person and he's producing extremely high quality stuff. Um, and I can vouch for it personally. So uh, we will have a link to purchase uh, from CanLab on the on our website for the show notes for in the show notes for this episode at theenergyblueprint.com forward slash can lab c a n l a b and you can go through that link and maybe Jean Francois will be nice enough to give our listeners a little discount if they want to purchase through that um, we haven't talked about that but hopefully he will. Yeah, and yeah, not not a huge one like some other would do. Be, again, you know. Just like, it is, just like it is made here. We cannot match China prices. So just like 90, 99% off the normal price, right? Just a small discount, 99% uh, off. <laughs> a bit more, but the other way around. But yeah, no, listen, it's going to be like reasonable for everybody. Great. Great. John Francois, thank you so much. I really appreciate everything. Thank you so much for all the extra time and oh, for sharing and your again, wisdom. Again, I...
sorry, I mentioned it, but I put it CanLab, C-A-N-L-E-B on, on, on uh, Facebook. Mm -hmm. I write, I'm not much of a writer, but key important things I put up there, like that study we did on the stability or little articles that, that there is a good one on GHK where right. I explain in details, you know, what I explained earlier. And I try key points that mostly correct misconceptions I do on that page. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much for all the extra time. And again, people can find the show notes and the, the link to CanLab at theenergyblueprint.com forward slash C-A-N-L-A-B. Thank you so much again, Jean-Francois. Hey, very welcome. It was again a pleasure. Hey there, this is Ari again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, if you found it valuable, please share it with your friends, share it with your family, help me get the word out there. Also, if you're on YouTube, make sure to hit the subscribe button and hit that little bell to get notifications every time we release a new video or new episode of the podcast. And if you're listening to this, make sure to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or on your favorite podcast app. Thanks so much for supporting my work at the Energy Blueprint. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I will see you in the next one.